Okay, welcome to History of Money. My name is Professor Barth, History Professor at Arizona State University, lecture number 10. Two parts today. Part A, we're going to take a, a just a, a brief look at the Renaissance as it spreads to Northern Europe, the Ottoman Empire, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, and then Portuguese exploration in order to find some route around these Italian and Ottoman middlemen. Part B, we're going to take a look at Tenochtitlan, the Aztec Empire, and then the Spanish conquest of Mexico and Peru, which of course has enormous implications for any study of, uh, of monetary history. One of the biggest monetary, uh, one of the biggest singular events in, in the history of money, that Spanish conquest of, of Mexico and Peru. Okay, so we've, we've taken a deep look at the Italian Renaissance. In the 15th century, this rebirth, this sort of awakening, you, could, you might call it, has spread northward from Italy first to Germany and then onward to other parts of Northern Europe. So that by, you know, this, the, um, the, 50, the 16th century, most of Europe, the Renaissance has, has infiltrated most of the continent. Um, remember Martin Luther posts his 95 theses in Germany in 1517, so the early 16th century. So in the North, commerce, which had already was already on the rise in the high middle ages further blossoms there was a, a a period in the 14th and early 15th century where where uh you know plague and and different peasant rebellions and political instability uh uh dealt a, a pretty major blow to to men, uh much of european civilization but by the 15th century things are coming back here's a map of europe around this time. And with this increased demand for silver in the 15th century, as Europe sort of, again, gets past this, you know, uh, a pretty, you know, dire 14th century, 13th and 14th century of, of some renewed problems, as Europe advances once again, the demand for silver coin increases. And with this increased demand for silver coin, actually the value of value of silver begins to rise. The price of silver begins to rise. Now you remember, may remember from way back when I talked about the price system in the very first uh, set of lectures that we had in this course. And, and I noted how prices are ingenious because they communicate, they send signals, they communicate knowledge about a, the, the demand in the, in the supply of a particular commodity. So as the demand for silver coin went up, the price went up, and then that price increase for silver sent a signal to producers, potential producers, that, hey, there's a lot of money to be made in mining. And, and this encourages uh, new capital investments in mining, new mining technologies, digging uh, uh, deeper into uh, some of the underground shafts and tunnels. So I haven't talked a whole lot about how mining was done back in those days for reasons of, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the expert in, in, in mining. However, mining in, in late antiquity into the medieval period, underground mining, used uh, uh, water and, uh, uh, it was called hydraulic mining. High pressure water, shoot it down the, the shaft, and that water would, would dislodge different uh, 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 rock uh, debris, would um, wash things out, expose the bedrock, expose gold and sil or silver veins, but it also had the problem of flooding and the, sh the shaft or the tunnel would be flooded. And that was a really big problem for sort of early mining. 
So as a result of that process, miners were unable to really go, go too deep into the earth. Mining, for the most part, uh, uh, was relegated to more shallow, shallow uh, extraction from the earth. Well, during the high Middle Ages and during the 15th century especially, new methods of, of uh, extracting water, removing water from these shafts, draining water from these shafts and tunnels, those methods are improved upon using uh, technologies such as the water wheel. And so now miners are able to go deeper into the earth. This is a much later diagram of underground mining from a, I think this is 18th century. I think it's 18th century. I might be wrong about that. It might be 19th, early 19th. But you see how deep they're going. Now in our period, 15th century, they're not going quite this deep yet. But they're going deeper than ever before, thanks to some of this new technology, um, investments in, in new, more sophisticated machinery. As a result, again, of this renewed ink, uh, heightened demand for, for silver. And then there were also advancements in alchemy or, or chemistry, which made it easier to uh, uh, extract or, or to remove the gold and silver to separate it from more worthless um, uh, base uh, minerals that either surrounded it or were mixed into it. In short, uh, new mining technologies made mining and extraction easier, and it leads to a silver mining boom in the 15th century. And the most uh, uh, famous and widely used silver coin that came out of this silver mining boom in Europe, and it was primarily in Germany, Bohemia, uh, states within the Holy Roman Empire, that coin was the taller, the taller. And of course, the German TH would be pronounced t taller, and taller technically in the German means a thing from the valley. Thing from the valley. Tall, T H A L, means valley, and then the E R, a thing from the valley. And actually, the original taller. Uh, came from a, uh, a, a town called uh, Joachimstall, Joachimstall, and there were Joachimstallers, uh, Joachim's Valley, uh, Joachim's thing of the valley, the silver coin. Um, but eventually these tallers make way all, th all throughout the uh, um, European continent. And then other regional mints, other state mints, also ad adopt the taller standard. And if you haven't figured it out, it out by now, taller is where we would get the name uh, dollar. So our dollar comes from the taller. Very interesting. Uh, but that, that is where that comes from. By the way, th these are different tallers uh, minted by various German states. You'll see here a U.S. quarter for comparison. So these are fairly large coins. These coins are about maybe three to four times the size of a, of a U.S. quarter. They're also a whole lot more valuable than a U.S. quarter. So, all right, Europe has, since the Crusades, and really actually back in Roman times, a, a demand for Eastern goods, and we've, we've looked at some of these, the cotton, the pepper, the spices, silk and porcelain, And we noted how this demand for Eastern goods gave uh, much prominence to Italy, the Italian peninsula and the merchants who operated in Italy as middlemen between continental Europe and the Near East, where the, the Italian merchants acquired the goods and then redistributed them throughout Europe. Europe um, exports to the East some goods, wool, uh, some cereal goods like wheat, but by and large, the Near East, India, China, just don't really have that much of a demand for European exports. The Orient uh, uh, that you see on the slide there, uh, a word used to be used, used to be deployed a lot more than formerly, but any area east of the Mediterranean. So all that land east of the Mediterranean, there's very little demand for European product. 
And so there's a massive trade deficit. And again, it's not the first time that there's been a trade deficit between Europe and the East. The Roman Empire suffered a trade deficit with India. And there's a trade deficit between Europe and, and the East. There's also a new power in the Near East, and that is the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire. Here is... Um, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, one of the early Sultans. And the Ottoman Empire had humble beginnings. It began in the late 13th century on the northwest corner of what today is Turkey, Asia Minor. And by 1450, the Ottomans had conquered the Balkans, or much of the Balkans, and surrounded what remained now the Byzantine Empire. Remember the Byzantine Empire, how vast it was. Now the Byzantine Empire is right there in the purple or the pink. In 1453, the Byzantine Empire uh, it officially ends and the Ottoman Empire conquers Constantinople. And the Ottomans begin a century, actually two centuries of considerable expansion so that the Ottomans come to dominate not only Asia Minor and Southeast Europe, but also the uh, Levant and, um, and then eventually parts of North Africa and the area along the Red Sea. So the Ottoman Empire is a major beneficiary of this trade between Europe and Asia because the Ottoman Empire is right there smack dab in the middle of these old world trade routes. You see there's Constantinople. The Ottomans, by the way, took Constantinople by use of cannon warfare. So um, the, the Ottomans are, are an advanced, quite an advanced civilization and they operate, they function as middlemen between Europe and Asia middleman merchant uh, as you recall is someone who buys product produced somewhere else and then sells it at a profit somewhere else so you have the ottomans as middlemen between europe and asia and then the italians as middlemen between the ottomans and the rest of europe so the ottomans and the italians are are doing quite well for themselves and we've already looked at the Italian money system, the Italian coinages. Here's some Ottoman coins from the period. It was a predominantly silver coinage. And you, you'll see here the uh, absence of any figure or, or face on the coin, but rather Arabic script some gold as well there's an ottoman gold coin but the ottomans become quite quite wealthy western europe even as western europe is in the middle of this northern renaissance that i spoke of earlier western europe is on the periphery or on the outer edge of this vast old world trade network and you see in the blue some of the trade networks that took place over uh, that took um, took place by sea, and then in the red overland trade routes. This is a little more detailed. Well, there's a lot of activity here in Europe. I mean, Europe is full fledged into a major major expansion of commerce, which inspires that silver mining boom. China's got a lot of markets too. The and then here in the Middle East, but it's on the outer edge, especially Western Europe. And that's gonna create a, a, uh, an incentive for Western European countries to open up an alternative route. An al alternative route will not come by land, but will come by sea. This is an Italian map of the old world in the 15th century. It was based on uh, Ptolemy's world map from the first century. Ptolemy was a, uh, a 
Greco-Egyptian cartographer. But not, not a bad map, pretty good. Especially, you know, here in the Near East and and in Europe. Totally botched India. Not sure what's going on there. And then, you know, so you can see the Far East is not known. And then Africa, you've got the North Africa and some of Northwest Africa, but then who knows? Who knows what happens as you go further down the African continent? This is a uh, map from a cartographer in Genoa around the same time. China is a little more accurate there. India still not accurate. Another one. Here there is some speculation. This is before Diaz. There's some speculation that there might be some route possibly around Africa. Well, the Portuguese, right there on the on that western periphery of the old world, the Portuguese inaugurate the, the, the first voyages. And the P Portuguese benefited from new nautical technology. Much of that came from the Italians, such as the Caravel, which was a very fast moving uh, lightweight ship. Henry the Navigator, whose um, picture portrait you find you'll see here, he's in the purple. And Henry the Navigator first in the uh, early part of the 15th century first uh, tracked along the northwest African coast, actually looking for, hoping to uh, come into uh, to find direct access to African gold. As the Europeans knew there's a lot of gold here in West Africa, but it's all going by caravan through the Sahara and accessed by Arabs in the Middle East before it then went to Europe. And so the Portuguese want, well, let's find direct access so we can trade directly with Africans for that gold instead of having to get it indirectly from Arabs. But Sir Henry, the navigator, ends up making some uh, very valuable maps and uh, uh, charts and paves the way for Bartolomeu Diaz here in the yellow to go farther than any one has gone down the African coast and in 1488 he rounds the Cape of Good Hope 1488 he rounds the Cape of Good Hope and in 1498 Vasco da Gama almost hits Brazil takes this route around Africa, makes some stops in East Africa, and then reaches India in 1498. So we focus a lot on Columbus, and perhaps rightly so, because we're here in America and, and that was a big deal, but this is a really, really major deal that this new alternative route has been found where, whereby Europeans and Western Europeans who are border the Atlantic Atlantic bordering European states can now have direct access to the east, to the far east, in this case South Asia, and, and eventually as far as China without having to go through Italy or without having to go through the Middle East. Now it'll take a while before they, quite, before they get there. This is a very long trip. It's an expensive trip. Nonetheless, this possibility has opened up. Now for part B, Oh, but this was uh, one of the first world maps after the uh, after this route was discovered. <laughs> you know, we can laugh at some of the inaccuracies, but hey, if you had nothing else to work on, this isn't a bad map. Still, I, I'm not sure what's going on with India there. Um, if, if if they have an exaggerated view of Sri Lanka and that's Sri Lanka, or or they just mistakenly think that the subcontinent of India is somewhere like Australia and is actually an island. Um, But of course, uh, 1492, Columbus makes the daring voyage west and says, you know what, I don't even want to go around the continent of Africa. I don't think we need to go around the continent of Africa. I'm sailing west for Asia. And, uh, but we will stop there and we'll continue. In, uh, part B, the conquest of Mexico and Peru. So see you for, for part B.